Yes, Mr. Anderson, so we move to your appeal now. We do. My lords, my lady, that I must first of all begin with a profound apology both personally and on behalf of my client that I have inadvertently misled you in relation to one issue, um, uh, and that is in relation to the question whether or not um, the materials that you have before you represent entirely what the Secretary of State. Whether or not the materials we have. Whether or not the materials before you in your bundle and the materials that were before the judge in the trial bundle represent all of the relevant material. Um, there was some discussion yesterday about the police national computer printout, um, uh, and uh, it's been brought to my attention that that printout does in fact exist in the Home Office file, um, and I've provided copies of that um, to, the, um, uh, to be handed up to the court. Um, My Lord, that's, yes, that's what the, 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 the GSID is clear that the, the, the PNC um, was something that the Home Office had on the 27th. Although you'll see that the document that I've handed up to you is dated the 5th of uh, February, or still marked in terms of the 5th of February. So this, in fact. A uh, 10, 10, sorry, Miss Pickup. This actually sets out the nature of the offence to possess imitation firearms and intended to cause fear it, of violence. It does, my lady, yes. So I was wrong. Does it give any further information? No. than the uh, conviction. Mm. Uh, my lady, what it, my lady, my lord, what it, what it gives you is, uh, you will recall an exchange between myself and Lord Justice Skippenbottom yesterday in relation to the question of whether or not the materials that the Secretary of State had made reference to the intention or just made reference to uh, the fact of possession of yeah. the yeah. file. What this, in my submission, makes clear is that there was reference to the intention yeah. to the where do we see that? Um, you see that page. on the, the last page. <clears throat> it's page two of three, isn't it? I'm sorry, I've got uh, three documents, well, three pages of what is the same document, yes. Uh, which page uh, is it, does it show? It's the last but one. Last but Number one. two. No. Was this? Uh, yeah. Oh, I two. Yes. I, I have marked page yeah. two or three at the top. Right. So let's call this page uh, four, shall we? And you now tell us, and was the judge aware of this, that the immigration officer, Mr. Benson, as it turns out, had this document and read it. My Lord, the judge was aware that the PNC, of the reference to the PNC on the GCID on the 27th, um, uh, but uh, the judge wasn't aware as to how the offence was characterised on that document. The judge proceeded on the basis that the offence was... Uh, or, or that the, um, you say the judge wasn't aware because the judge did not have this document. That's right. And you produce it now for the first time. Yes. And that's why you're apologising, I understand. That's, that's yes, right, yes. Yes. yes, right. Uh, right, well, thank you. So, I, I what is worth, what that, we see what the words with intent. That yesterday, but that's the, yes. That's the um, I should also apologise in relation to, there was an exchange in relation to the procedure by which a referral would have been um, made. And I suggested that the referral would only have been made if a, if a minimum uh, sentence had been, um, uh, had been passed. I'm told that that's not, um, that that's not correct. Um, and so, um, I draw that part. What, what is incorrect? Uh, my, my Lord, you, you were asking about the process by which a referral would be made to the criminal case court team of the Secretary of State where uh, an EPA national was convicted of an offence. And I had suggested that my understanding was that that referral would only be made if the sentence passed was at a minimum uh, of, of duration. 12 months or so. Uh, yes. Um, I, I understand that that's not in fact the case. So, just so everybody clear, uh, if um, if a foreign national offender 
uh, is convicted of an offence, then do they automatically go to the, this team in the Home Office? It, it's not automatic, my Lord. A, a referral can be made variously by the um, prison or, in some circumstances, by the uh, court. But I'm told that there's not a threshold set in terms of the duration of the... Um, not a set. special? Not a threshold set in terms of the duration of the sentence. So it wasn't the fact that this individual got 14 months that, that triggered this? Well, that, my Lord, appears to be what triggered the fact that there was then the um, decision to detain and consider him with a view to deportation. It's not all cases that will be actively considered for removal. But in terms of the question of whether or not the Secretary of State will be notified, uh, they don't necessarily need to meet a, a minimum threshold. So I'm not know. understanding this reference to a minimum threshold. What, what, what's it all about? It, it, my Lord, it was in an exchange between myself and Lord Justice Hickenbottom yesterday in which the court was inquiring about what caused or gave rise to the referral to the Secretary of State uh, from the um, relevant authorities um, <coughs> so that the Secretary of State was then informed of this individual and of the fact he'd been convicted. Yeah. Um, and the, the short point is that making a referral to the Secretary of State there isn't necessarily a, a minimum duration of sentence no. before a referral would be uh, before a referral would be made. And so all sentences of foreign offenders are referred, aren't they? I, I, I can't, my lord, put it as, as high as that. Simply, there's no there's no threshold in terms of uh, when a referral can be made. Right. Mm. Um, we have no evidence as to the criteria or the criteria for referral. We we, we know that in some way, uh, cases are referred to the Home Office yes. for consideration. Yes. And this one was clearly on the 27th of January. Um, but we don't know exactly why. That's right. I and mean, it seems to have been from the court to the Home Office, but we don't know quite how that's happened. That's right. Um, my Lord, um, my Lord, my lady, if I can then open the Secretary of State's um, appeal. Um, there are two issues in relation to the Secretary of State's appeal. Um, uh, the first in relation to uh, liability in respect of periods two, um, and the second in relation to the question whether or not the claimant should have been entitled to nominal or compensatory damages. Um, in relation um, then uh, to the first, if we can start by looking at the uh, judge's approach to stage two, which is in the core bundle at page 195. this, of course, uh, in, in, what would in, be helpful for me at any rate is just to get uh, some dates in mind, which uh, I'm not sure I've got completely clear in, in my mind. Uh, stage one began on the 27th, noon on the 27th to noon on the 28th, and uh, that was when the detention order uh, was made by Mr. Benson, uh, and um, uh, 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 when uh, was it that uh, uh, the first uh, step was taken to get more information? I have so, a feeling it was the 29th of January. So on the 28th of January, there is a limited step taken. Um, uh, you can see this in the um, GCID record at in the supplementary bundle of 249, where a uh, request was made... Sorry, my lord, no, yes, it's the, it's the 29th of January uh, where requests are made for a biodata and photo interview request and a number of documents are requested from third parties. The, um, that's the 29th of January. That's the 20, uh, <coughs> 29th of January. That's yes, it. right, well, um, that's what we'll call the first request, shall we? Yes. Uh, which included... Uh, what seems to me the most important one, Ron Hull, uh, the uh, pre-sentence report. The OASIS report, as it's called there. Yes. Yes. R r right. Um, and, and so 
uh, the judge doesn't uh, uh, exactly make this clear, but at paragraph uh, 62, which I think we're about to refer us to, he is effectively saying, is he not, um, uh, that the information should have been requested before the 29th, within, uh, thus within 24 hours of the detention. Yes. Yes. He says that the failure to make the request within 24 hours of detention um, was such as to, uh, maybe yeah. the Secretary of State uh, had exceeded or had failed to act with, as he described it, imperative urgency. Yes. Now, that is a phrase used of, of, of the judge's own, is it? There's no authority for it. That's right. Yes. Yes. Um, and that's where we say, or submit on behalf of the Secretary of State, that the threshold applied by the judge, or the test applied by the judge, considering whether or not um, uh, the detention was lawful, uh, is pitched too high. So what is the right test? I would submit that the correct test is essentially to ask whether or not the Secretary of State had uh, behaved unreasonably, i.e. whether there was an unreasonable delay in terms of obtaining further information. I don't say unreasonable in the Wednesbury sense, but unreasonable in the Hardy or Singh um, sense. And I say that in practical terms, there is no reason to think that that yields any different outcome or would yield any different outcome from applying the proportionality um, necessity test, which the... Well, speaking entirely uh, for myself, I might rather agree with that. But then the question is, was it not reasonable to expect the Secretary of State exercising this very grave power of administrative uh, detention to get the OASIS report within 24 hours? Well, my lord, in my submission, um, uh, no. I should first of all say with regards to the OASIS report itself, in fact, the Secretary of State was informed that no, no OASIS report had been completed. And you can see that on the GCID at um, 250 in the supplementary bundle. We, we, we know that that's wrong, but that's yes. apparently what he was told. That's, that, that's right. Um, where do we see that? Uh, it's in the supplementary bundle at page 250. Yes. Where? You'll see about oh, halfway yes. down the page, call received from Lucy at HMP Norwich. No oasis has been completed. No um, offender manager. So the... But in fact, it had been. And it would have to have been if there was going to be a sentence. In fact, an oasis report had been, um, uh, had been completed. That wasn't, in fact, obtained until some time uh, later on the on or around the 30th of um, March. Um, the OASIS report was not obtained report. until the 30th of March. My lords, no. What, the, what was obtained in the meantime, if I take you through the chronology of, of, of period two, it might assist in terms of what, um, of what was obtained and when. And I think it's probably best if we stick with the, the GCID and the supplementary bundle in terms of, uh, in, in terms of that chronology. Um, so on the 29th, there's the response from HMP Norwich to say that there is no OASIS um, uh, assessment. Um, uh, and then on the um, 4th of February, the next step that you've got is that the claimant has seen um, at HMP Norwich a biodata, that's the biographical data form, is completed, um, uh, which it indicates is to be faxed the following day as um, there's been a failure of uh, transmission. Um, and uh, that she, sir, sent re. Is that judge's sentencing remarks? Uh, so th that, that, my lord, is on the 9th of February, yes. So that's the 9th of February, is it? So you see that on the, on the 4th, there's the meeting at HMP Norwich, at which the biographical date is taken, um, uh, and there's a summary there as to what the um, uh, claimant then said. I should note the claimant had been served by this time um, with the notice of his liability to deportation, which includes the deportation questionnaire. Um, so when an individual is informed that they're um, liable to be um, uh, deported, they're provided with a questionnaire which they're to complete within 10 working days. Um, and you can see the um, uh, notice of liability itself at uh, 49 to 50 of the supplementary bundle. And that was completed. I'm sorry, what do we see where? 49 to 50 of the supplementary bundle. 
you will see that there's a notice of liability to deportation. This doesn't get a mention on the GCID record, is that right? Um, that, my lord, is where there's the reference uh, on the 29th of January. Uh, paperwork will be served on FC tomorrow when IO attends. That paperwork is a reference, as I understand it, to the deportation paperwork, which was dated the 27th of January, but served on the 30th of January. Yes. Right. And you can see that that was served on the 30th of January uh, from page 50 of the supplementary bundle. Yes. But, uh, so what, what we're really interested in is uh, uh, surely what's at the bottom of the page. The, the reason, my lord, that I, draw, that I draw your attention to this is that in terms of the overall process of considering whether or not the claimant should be removed. Um, the claimant himself is obviously entitled to make representations, both as to whether he should be removed, but also as to whether his case should be certified so that his appeal has to be pursued out of country. Um, and the notice that he was given gave him uh, 10 working days to do so. And so I simply note that in terms of the consideration of that question whether the claimant should be removed, no decision would be taken in any event until the claimant's response to the notice had been received. Well, that may be so, but what we're interested in is the detention, not the deportation at this stage. My, my, my lords, yes, but I say that in considering the uh, reasonableness of the administrative steps that were taken by the um, Secretary of State, the context in which the Secretary of State is gathering information with a view to taking that removal decision uh, is, uh, is important. Effectively, my submission is that the judge, or the test applied by the judge, uh, the threshold that the judge applied, uh, is, is excessive. And in my submission, um, uh, it, it period of detention overall in relation to period two was one that was reasonable in all, of the, in all of the circumstances, but it would of course be open to the court if it considered it appropriate to consider that some lesser period uh, should have been permitted for the Secretary of State to, to gather the information specific to the decision to detain. Um, I, still, I still find this distinction you draw between the Secretary of State and the other arms of the government very difficult. Uh, here, we know there was a, a pre-sentence report um, which was available from 31st of December, yes. uh, and, and the State had it. Um, the Ministry of Justice must, must have had it. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but you say that the, the Secretary of State can hide behind the fact that when the, 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 uh, he made, I suppose you say, reasonable inquiries, yes. and was told that it didn't exist, but that's, that's enough to keep this man locked up. Well, my Lord, I, I, in relation to that, the judge didn't find that it was necessary for the Secretary of State to have the OASIS report. And that finding by the judge hasn't been challenged. There's no claim that the Secretary of State had to have the OASIS report itself. But can uh, I just intervene? Because there's a matter that's concerning me, and I'm just conscious I'm going to muddy the waters. We have been referring to the OASIS report on an assumption that it was the pre-sentence report. I'm not sure that it is. Oh, the, the, yes. Because the pre-sentence report is in a different I've seen many pre-sentence reports, and they're in a very different form to this OASIS report. Where is the OASIS report? It's page, it begins at page 8 in the supplementary bundle. Page 8? Yeah. Well, that, that, well that, that seems to me to be a fair point. The pre-sentence report, or a document headed pre-sentence report, is at page 1. Yeah. Yes. With, yes. with, with a document headed OASIS assessment at page That's 8. That's it. Yes, yes. And what the judge will have had is the document at page one. What seems to be sought is the document we have at page eight, which is actually dated the 30th of March. But that might be the date in which that's printed. Right, that's okay then. Right, um, thank you. But yes, the, the, the OASIS report isn't the pre-sentence report. No, the pre -sentence I think report. we're using the term slightly ah. loosely. Yeah. My, to, to be clear then, in, in terms of the material that the judge below considered um, uh, necessary in terms of fulfilling the Article 27 duty. Um, you can see that in his judgment at 
paragraph um, 66 on page 56 66 at page 197 of the core bond 66 So the, the claimants had argued that his detention was unlawful throughout the period of uh, detention. Um, and the judge rejected that submission in relation to what the judge described as, uh, on the Article 27 grounds, in relation to stages 3 and um, uh, 4. And you'll see that at 66, he says he does not accept there was any breach of the Article 27 two standards at stages 3 and 4. By the time of the 25th of February detention review and the 24th of February deportation certification decision, the material before the Secretary of State was much fuller and had been evaluated. The JSR, that's the judge's sentencing remarks, had been received on the 18th of February, as well as the letter uh, of the 9th of uh, February and the questionnaire of the 12th of February. And, and that's, what is a ref that's a reference to um, correspondence from the claimant. Um, uh, and the reference to the questionnaire is to the completed deportation questionnaire. You have those documents uh, in the supplementary uh, reference bundle. Um, if you go to... Yeah, just uh, give us the reference. Uh, 62, SB 62, supplementary bundle page 62, is the uh, letter from the claimant. And then page 64. 64. Is, is the questionnaire. The 64 onwards is the questionnaire. Right, yes. Um, so, JSR received 18 February, as well as those two documents from the claimant, um, and information from social services on 21st. Now, what's the information from social services? Um, the information from social services is recorded on the uh, GCID, um, so you get that in the um, supplementary bundle um, uh, at page 252. Where at the bottom you'll see it says call made to Suffolk Children's Services for update on email sent 19 February 2015. Yes. Then he says that the pre sentence report was still not obtained until the 26th of February 2015. Yes. And that is the document at page one. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and, and of course, you know, there, there, there is no challenge to the judge's conclusion at paragraph 66 as to the material that was available before the Secretary of State by the 25th of February being sufficient for the purposes of the Article 27 um, individualised consideration and proportionality threshold. Yeah. The claim doesn't challenge its conclusions in relation to period three of the detention, um, uh, detention at all. But just to be clear then in terms of the different bits of information there were that would have provided more detail about the underlying circumstances of the claimant's behaviour, you have the judge's sentencing remarks themselves, you have the pre-sentence report, and you then have the OASIS report which was produced on the 31st of December 2014. So going back to page uh, 245249, uh, 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 is it? Or, uh, 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 y yes. Um, uh, no. Uh, uh, bottom 250, which is where we were. Uh, and you say the date of this is what? The 9th of February, is that right? Uh, at the bottom, chaser email sent. Read sentencing remarks. TRS. What's that? Um, the trial record sheet. Trial record sheet. Yes. Appeal. That's presumably Mr. Luzisek's appeal. The Oasis report. Offender manager detail. And so the pre-sentence report was not at that stage requested at all. Um, the well, I, th I, I, I think my was that the um, the, 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 the request for the. I'm sorry, my lord. I'm just I'm just looking. Uh, 
just know from the judgment that it arrived by the uh, 26th of February. We'll take that from the judge. Oh, I, I, I'm told the pre-sentence report comes from the, 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 the that sent by the claimants with, in their in their letter, uh, which was sent uh, uh, on in 26th of February. It was sent by the claimant. Yes. And that, that 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 would make sense in terms of the the, the, the Secretary of State's request for the Oasis, because the Oasis report is the more up to date of the documents. That would be the document that uh, would indicate or, or may in indicate uh, what's been done, for example, in the course of somebody's um, uh, detention. So the reason for that we can go into a lot of bureaucratic detail as to what documents are relevant and what uh, uh, is best and all that sort of thing. But the question is, if you're going to lock somebody up, uh, should you not get whatever is necessary, uh, and perhaps I'm wrong to emphasize the pre-sentence report in particular, whatever is necessary, of which the print sentence report one would think would be something, uh, within 24 hours. Well, my lord, I say that the question about the time that um, uh, is always going to be a matter for consideration in light of all of the circumstances of the case. Um, I'd like to take it to two authorities, if I may, in relation to uh, that issue, um, which are both in terms of the application of the hard and principles. Um, uh, but first, it, it, it must be a fact sensitive. It's a fact sensitive exercise, exercise absolutely, my lord, yes. Undoubtedly. I'd like an answer to my question before we go to authorities. Why is it not reasonable to expect the Secretary of State, if he's about to lock somebody up in administrative detention, to take uh, whatever steps are necessary within 24 hours? It's not as if the documents are not available, don't exist. Well, my Lord, I, I say that that puts the question in the wrong way with, with great respect. But the question that has to be asked is whether there has been unreasonable delay on the part of the Secretary of State. Rather than saying, would it be reasonable to do X, it's asking, was it unreasonable that X wasn't done? And in applying that question, uh, and, and this is why I think the authorities are relevant, the courts recognize that there is a difference between administrative uh, failings, which arise from time to time, and administrative failings that are significant enough or so unreasonable that they amount to illegality. And you, you well, let me get just get this quite clear, because I mean, it's uh, rather uh, sort of cavilling propositions, it seems to me. The right question, says the Home Secretary, is whether in the circumstances he acted unreasonably. And it would be wrong to ask what was it reasonable for him to do. That is the submission. My Lord, I, 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 if you ask, is it reasonable for somebody to do something that may have a different connotation than asking, well, was it unreasonable that uh, something didn't happen? Um, and I, can I take you, if I, if, I, if I may, to the authorities, which I think are, have a bearing on this. There's, there's two um, that I'd like to take you to, if I may. The, the first is Krasniki. Which is in the authorities bundle at uh, 26. Which bundle? The authorities bundle at par uh, tab 26. Which authorities the bundle? Second, uh, the second volume of second. authorities. And you will see that Paragraph 12, Lord Justice Carnwa observes about halfway down the page that to found a claim in damages for wrongful detention. It is not enough that, in retrospect, some part of the statutory process is shown to have taken longer than it should have done. There is a dividing line between mere administrative failing and unreasonableness amounting to illegality. Even if that line has been crossed, it is necessary for the claimant to show a specific period during which, but for the failure, he would no longer have been detained. So this is 
in the context of Lord Justice Carmarth considering the fourth of the Hardeel Singh principles. The second authority um, that I would like to take to you is J.S. Sudan, which is at tab 29. There are two points that I want to draw from this authority. The first is just to note at paragraph 15 that where detention is for the purpose of considering whether somebody may be removed, the Hardeel Singh principles obviously have to be modified somewhat. That was a case to do with the automatic deportation regime rather than a case to do with EEA nationals. But the modifications proposed must apply mutatis mutandis, i.e. that uh, so far as the purpose is concerned, the purpose must be to detain the person in order to consider whether they may be removed rather than the usual hard deal seeing first principle in order to remove because, of course, no decision has yet been taken that the person is going to be removed. But, but in, in this case, because I think on your analysis, this is, I think this is wrong, um, on, on day one, the purpose of the de detention uh, was in effect um, to determine um, uh, whether he should be detained. Well, the, 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 the purpose of the detention on, 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 on day one uh, what r remained to consider whether or not he should be um, whether or not he should be removed. That was the reason why he was detained, in order to enable the Secretary of State to consider whether or not um, he should be um, uh, removed. That's the statutory power that was exercised and, and, the, and the purpose of detaining. But, but, the, but the initial task for the um, uh, Secretary of State was to determine, um, was to obtain sufficient information to determine whether he should be detained. My Lord, in, in my submission, that's, that's not quite right in terms of the, the, the power that's, that's being exercised. The, the power that's being exercised is the power to detain in order to consider whether he may be uh, removed. The claimant's argument was that under Article 27 of the Citizens Directive, the information that the Secretary of State needed in terms of Article 27 in order to do that required more detailed information about the conduct of the um, claimant going beyond the um, fact of the uh, offence and the um, information as to the sentence that the Secretary of State had. Um, it's in that context that the judge reaches the conclusion that the material that the Secretary of State had is sufficient to satisfy Article um, 27 for that first day but that because the Secretary of State didn't seek that further information that was required uh, under Article 27 sufficiently promptly, the detention wasn't compatible with Article 27. It was never argued that in domestic law terms, this period of detention was unreasonably long, uh, having regard to the statutory purpose for which it was exercised. Um, that, that was never the argument before, no. before the court. No. So. Because uh, this is an EEA case. Uh, well, my, my, my Lord, but al although it's an EEA case, the Hardy Singh principles still apply. Um, and it wasn't argued that there had been a breach of the Hardy Singh principles in relation to this part of the claimant's detention, uh, so far as uh, any argument that the Secretary of State hadn't uh, acted with sufficient expedition in terms of considering the information with a view to affecting his removal. That, that's not part of the claimant's claim. The claimant made a general submission that they said um, that he should never have been detained at all because there were alternatives in the form of release subject to conditions, but that was rejected by the judge. So there was never a challenge in this case on the basis that in domestic law terms, this period of detention was contrary to the fourth uh, hard Singh principle or, or any of the other hard Singh principles as... Um, the what we've got to deal with is the judge's conclusion that because yes. we're in Article 27 territory, uh, you may be allowed a certain amount of indulgence as long as it's not automatic uh, 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 for effectively 24 hours but no longer. Yes. That's the 
but what you've got to deal with. That, 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 that's absolutely right, my lord. And what I say in relation to that is, obviously, this is a fact-sensitive exercise. I say that 24 hours is pitching it in terms of the time that's allowed for the Secretary of State uh, to you know, have a regard to the, um, uh, the fact that the government information isn't necessarily restricted. The fact that another branch of the state holds information doesn't uh, mean that, as it were, it's, 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 it's automatically imputed. And you can see from the steps that are taken that from 29 onwards, the Secretary of State is seeking the information and actively chasing um, the information and is unable to reach a conclusion um, in relation to the question of uh, removal, which was the purpose of exercising the power. And as I say, there's no challenge to that, that, that was the purpose of exercising the power um, uh, within the period of um, uh, a little under 30 days. Um, so that, obviously, if the court um, is it with me in terms of the sufficiency of the information uh, on the basis of the um, sentence on period one, on, on day one, then the Secretary of State's appeal in relation to um, ground two can't succeed. But if it's accepted that there's enough in Article 27 terms uh, on the 27th, uh, my submission is simply that detention didn't then become unlawful on the 28th because the Secretary of State hadn't by then uh, informed himself of the, of the full position. But, but, to, but uh, to, to return to my Lord's question, um, you, you have to show that the um, the judge below uh, could not have come to the conclusion that 24 hours was um, long enough to get some pretty basic information, which must have been available uh, to um, certainly must have been available to the Ministry of Justice in terms of all sorts of documents, including the Oasis assessment, uh, including. Um, the, the presented report uh, on the OASIS assessment assesses not, not just this doesn't just set out the um, uh, facts of the offence, but also obviously assesses the future risk. Um, so, but, so it, whatever we might think about 24 hours, um, are you saying that the judge was wrong? Well, um, what, what I say, my lord, is that the judge in this case applied the wrong test because he applied the test of imperative urgency, as he characterised it. For which there is no authority. There is no authority. Yes. I say that test pitches things too high. And I say because the judge erred in principle in that way, it is then open for the court to consider... whether or not, as it were, it agrees with the evaluation that the Secretary of State has to secure that further information in the 24-hour period. Yes, but I think we have your submission, but you were in the middle of saying that for at least one reason, and possibly more reasons, you wanted to refer to uh, paragraph J 15 of J.S. Sudan. It's a very long yes. paragraph. You don't want to read the whole paragraph, do you? Um, my lord, no. It was simply to say that in terms of the hard Singh principles as they applied at this point, which is what the domestic analog is, they, um, they apply as they have to apply with modification because the classic state of the principles is that detention is exercised uh, with, a, uh, with a view to removal. In cases where the, the power to detain is exercised in order to consider whether somebody should be removed, obviously it's a different power that's been used. Um, and um, uh, there's no change to the principle that the detention can only be for a period that's reasonable in all the circumstances. Um, but there is a change in the formulation to the third of the principles um, uh, in that the principle will be infringed if detention continues, even though it's apparent that either resolution of the question whether a person should be removed or um, subsequent removal or both together would take more than a reasonable um, it's far more Time. complicated than I'm understanding. What is your my, proposition? My apologies, my lord. Um, in, in domestic law terms, the principles that have to be satisfied when the Secretary of State exercises the power to detain are the Hardy Singh principles. Yes. The classic formulation of the Hardy Singh principles, as it's approved in uh, Lumba, 
is in the context of cases where a decision has been taken to deport or remove. And so it can only be exercised for that power. The period of detention has to be reasonable in all the circumstances. And if it's apparent that removal can't be affected within a reasonable period well, we of time. You know what the Hollywood principles are. Yes. What, what, is your, what, what is the point of your submission? What are you going at? The point of my submission, my lord, is simply that because in this case you're dealing with a power to detain in order to consider whether somebody should be removed, those principles are modified. Um, modified the, more generously to the Secretary of State? I, I'm not saying whether they're modified more generally, more generously to the Secretary of State. Well, how yeah. modified? They're modified, my lord, because so far as the first principle is concerned, obviously the relevant purpose is different. So far as the second principle is concerned, there's no change. So far as the third principle is concerned, um, and in a sense less generously to the Secretary of State, um, the principle applies that if before the expiry of a reasonable period, it becomes apparent that the Secretary of State will not be able um, to resolve the question whether to deport or effect deportation or both together, there would be a breach of the third principle. I.e., when you're considering the question of reasonableness, you have to ask, will the Secretary of State be able to take a decision whether to deport within a reasonable period of time, as well as the question of whether or not they could be deported within a reasonable time? Um, but but in, in, in period one and two, we're not in Hardeel Singh territory. Well, the Hardeel Singh principles apply to, to, to detention. I'm simply making the point that there was no challenge in relation to the, um, uh, the, the, the third or fourth of those principles having been breached on the grounds that the Secretary of State um, wasn't acting with sufficient expedition. Because the focus in stage one and two is Article 27. That's the, my Lord, yes, that, that's, uh, that, that's the focus of the claimant's challenge, absolutely. My, my point is simply that, that there was no challenge in relation to that domestic analogue, and I submit that that domestic analogue, in terms of the question about proportionality or um, necessity under EU law. There's no reason to think that proportionality or necessity under EU law requires a more stringent um, test. So, of, of course, the, the, the claimant's argument in relation to period two in, in terms of the judge's judgment in this point is, of course, that they say there hasn't been the individualized assessment on the basis of sufficient material. My submission is that the court accepts and should accept for the same reasons as the judge did, that on the time of the decision to detain, there was sufficient material to satisfy the requirement that there be an individualized um, consideration, then there's no reason to conclude that that period subsequently became uh, unlawful on the basis that the Secretary of State hadn't been um, acting with, uh, with, with due diligence. So the essence of your submission is uh, that... Uh, 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 albeit that we are in Article 27 territory, uh, uh, the hard you'll see principles apply by analogy, and uh, uh, provided that the uh, 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 Secretary of State has done nothing unreasonable, uh, then uh, the tension is justified. The Secretary of State has cleared the threshold of having the sufficient information to make an individualised decision in Article 27 terms. Um, and if that aspect of the Article 27 um, safeguard has been satisfied, then, then in my submission, um, uh, when you're then considering the reasons for period of detention thereafter precisely, there's no reason to think that you will give a different outcome to yes. the part of the Right. Well, I think we have that submission. That's my submission. And that is your case on the liability. Uh, my Lord, um, yes. Yes. Um, and, and I say in terms, just very briefly, the, um, why I say um, the, uh, uh, sorry, I should, you, you're right, I was in J.S. Sudan, I was taking two points. One was the um, uh, amendments to the test. The other was just, and this goes to my Lord Justice um, Hickenbottom's um, point, um, that um, in considering the question whether or not, and this was for the purposes of the automatic deportation regime, the Secretary of State needs to begin the process of decision making before the custodial sentence expires. Is um, J.S. Sudan going to help on that? It, it simply says, perhaps unsurprisingly, that that's a fact-sensitive question and will depend upon the consideration of all the relevant 
And the fact that IC relevant is of particular importance in this case is that the Secretary of State uh, only becomes aware of this individual at the point at which their sentence has already ended because of the fact of time served on the mark. So that, that's the sh short. As, as a matter of principle, you, you may have said this was, was not so on the facts in this case, but as a matter of principle, um, uh, the Secretary of State could have taken um, a, a lawful Article 27 compliant decision on very, very limited um, individualised information on day one um, to give him time to get more information about the circumstances of the offence, for example. Uh, but there may come a point in time, uh, perhaps it was, you have said, on day two, uh, when uh, uh, he should have got more information and made a, 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 a new individualised uh, decision on the, uh, for, for all of the information available. So it's a, it's a yeah. sort of rolling uh, matter, isn't it? My, my Lord, I mean, I, I accept in, in, in principle that that's... Um, that, that, that that's correct. Um, I simply say that when we consider the approach that's been taken in relation to questions of the courts have recognised that information gathering is, is not always a, a, a quick or straightforward um, uh, exercise. Um, right, so that's your submission on liability. Yes. And the, the now, point for the purpose of quantum, we have to assume you're wrong about that, don't we? My, my yes. yes. You only get to the question of nominal versus compensatory damages if I'm wrong yes. in relation to yes. the principal yes. submission. Uh, but I, should also, I, I don't think I need to take you to it, but I, I rely on, on Razley in terms of the, the analogue between the level of domestic and European protection. Um, you rely on what? New Asley. It's a decision you were taken to yesterday in the Supreme, um, in the Supreme Court. Um, I don't necessarily invite you to, to turn that up again right, right now. Um, but... I accept that the specific issue that the Supreme Court was dealing with, or one of the specific issues that the Court was dealing with, was the argument by the claimant in that case that the absence of a time limit meant that the powers under the European Economic uh, Area Regulations that were in breach of the standards in Article 27. The Secretary of State's response was um, that when you consider that detention is subject to the Hardy and Singh principles, and when you consider the link between the... Um, uh, detention and the decision to remove and the safeguards that apply to that, there was no um, incompatibility um, on, on the basis of the absence of a. Uh, well, a Mr. Time. Minsky explained all that to us, yes. and uh, uh, we have that on board. But is yes. that relevant to liability or to quantum? Um, I, my, 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 well, that, that goes to liability. I simply flag that that's part of the. Right. The, the, the Secretary of State says you can take more from the Supreme Court's approval in New Asley than Mr. Minsky would allow. That's the short point. Yes. My Lord, moving on then to the question of quantum um, and whether it should be nominal or compensatory damages. If we turn up how the judge approached this um, uh, issue as our starting point, and it's in the core bundle, and... Just before we look at the, what the judge said, do, do you have a proposition for uh, um, determining whether... Yes, so my lord, I, I say that in all cases, the question is whether somebody could and would lawfully have been detained. That's the question that Lumba requires you to ask. I accept that the burden in relation to that falls on the Secretary of State. I submit that the counterfactual that you will need to engage in will depend on the nature of the breach. I submit that where the nature of the breach is a failure to make inquiry and consider the results of that inquiry, You have to ask what would have happened had the inquiry been made and the results considered. 
And the crucial error that the judge makes in his approach is that he says that you can't look at the hypothetical outcome of the inquiry. He says you can only look at the material that was before the decision maker. And I say that's wrong in principle. It's not consistent, I submit, with the authorities. And I submit that the reasons the judge gives for reaching that conclusion conflate questions that go to liability and policy considerations that go to liability with questions that go to damages. So if I can begin um, with page 194 of the core bundle. Uh, and paragraph 59 uh, point 7 where the judge says that he agrees with Mr. Binsky that if no legally adequate evidence and reasons were present it's no answer to say that detention would have continued to the Secretary of State had such further information as could have been available to her. That's, in a sense, the conclusion. And the judge's reasons in respect to that conclusion are at paragraph 64, which is where he's considering the question of compensatory versus nominal damages. Yes, well, again, of course, we've... Uh Yes. Uh, he says he cannot accept your submission, but it's uh, six, seven lines down. He then says, in the first place, yes. is there ever a second place? Um, my Lord, uh, th there are second points, but I don't think there's a second place as such. Um, uh, so it's a seamless reasoning, it's a seamless is it? Transition. Yes, it's not as if there's a, two separate reasons. He, he begins by saying it's well established that the legality of detention is considered on the basis of the material that is before the Secretary of State. Well, I take no issue with that proposition. Um, but, that, but that's liability. But that's liability. Uh, he says that's a principled approach which can and should cut both ways. And he says the Secretary of State is not to be castigated but neither exonerated by material of which she was not aware at the time of the decision to detain or continue uh, detention. Now, now, pausing there... Um, it's not a question when you're looking at compensatory versus nominal damages of exonerating the Secretary of State. It's a question of whether or not the individual claimant has actually suffered a loss of liberty that they would otherwise have enjoyed. He then says it is one thing to say on the same evidence as was before the Secretary of State at the time that a decision involving some public law breach would have been the same absent that breach. That, he says, is what the approach to nominal damages in Lumba is envisaging. It is quite another thing to posit different material as having been before the Secretary of State. Even if that would be a correct approach in a case based on a public law breach being a failure of the so-called tame side duty of sufficient inquiry, I agree with Mr. Binsky that is not this case. Now, pausing there, the, the tame side duty, as the court may well be familiar with, is the duty on a decision maker to take reasonable steps to inform themselves uh, of the relevant facts so that they can take a proper decision. But in my submission, it, it's plain that if the breach of public law takes a form of that sort of, uh, a breach of that sort of duty, in asking whether or not a person uh, would, uh, could and would lawfully have been detained uh, had there not been the uh, tortious conduct, you have to ask, well, what would have happened if the inquiry had been made? And if the answer is it would have made no difference, then the person hasn't suffered uh, any genuine loss. Now, we'll take you to some examples uh, in the um, case law. But before I do that, I just want to continue with the judge's reasoning to note why the judge says that this would be different from a tame side sort of case. He says, the Article 2072 standards involve an inquiry 
as part of a substantively reasoned and justified outcome. And the wording and clear purpose of the standard stand is meaningful protection from action lacking a presently evaluated and informed justification based on individual conduct and threat. The state can make an informed decision or not impose a restriction. Well, pausing there, that again is effectively going to the question of liability and saying what does the state need to do in order for its action to be lawful? It's not looking at the quite different question whether or not the individual has established an entitlement to substantive damages. The next point, he says, is in my judgment to undermine the discipline safeguard of the Article 27.2 standards, were the executive able to avoid liability for unlawful detention under standards of proportionality and necessity by reference to what an individualised inquiry would have elicited had it been undertaken. But with respect to the learned judge, the argument isn't about the state escaping liability. It's about whether or not there's an entitlement to compensatory damages, which is a different question. Um, he then says I that... I don't think it would make much difference to the judges thinking if he had said able to avoid liability for substantial damages for unlawful detention. Well, my word, it, it might not make a difference to the judges thinking, but that would be an erroneous approach to say that damages are going to be awarded because as a matter of policy, we think that's the best way in order to protect this particular safeguard. And, and that's what the judge appears to be um, doing. He says that reasoning stands to excuse detention based on suspicion, provided that the suspicion proves well-founded after the event. It stands to legitimize a detained first ask questions later arbitrariness. Well, with respect to, to the learned judge, it does no such thing. If the Secretary of State um, has acted unlawfully in failing to make the relevant inquiry, then the Secretary of State will be found to have acted unlawfully. Arguments about whether or not there should be compensatory or nominal damages aren't arguments about excusing or exonerating or legitimising the action that was taken that was unlawful. But, but, I mean, but to, to, to put your submission in, in, in one sentence, the, the focus of um, the liability exercise in these cases is on the Secretary of State. The focus of, of, of the damages exercise is on the claimant. Yes. And what you say here is that um, the judge is modelled up to sue. I mean, and so he's effectively modelling up liability and quantum. Yeah. Uh, but his focus isn't on the claimant, it's actually on the Secretary of State. Exactly, my lord. My lord. He's, he's not asking what has the claimant lost, he's asking what has the Secretary of State done. And, and when it comes to damages, and this is clear from Lumba, ordinary compensatory principles apply. And that isn't just true in, in, in the context of um, deprivations of liberty arising in the context of immigration detention. And you have in the authorities the case of Oxlease and uh, Bostridge. Um, if I can take you to, to that um, authority. It's at 32. Of the authority. Now, what are you citing this authority for? Um, well, my lord, I cite it for um, the uh, principle, precisely that my lord Justice Hickenbottom has um, uh, identified, that, that the focus is on putting the claimant in the position that they would have been in had the tort not been committed. And the relevant paragraphs are at um, 20, which is sidelined. Twenty-three. Do you want to read these paragraphs? Don't go too fast. Oh, I'm sorry, my lord. Paragraph twenty. I mean, the the, the, the proposition you, you you cite this for is the proposition you've just made, isn't it? And that is that um, damages for false imprisonment, damages in these sorts of cases. Um, the, the principles are exactly the same as in any other case. Yes. There's, there's, there's no difference. Yes. And I, I think it is also notable because um, 
the court at paragraphs um, 28 to 30 rejects submissions along the lines that damages should be available for policy reasons in terms of reflecting It doesn't mean very much to be just to read what was an award of damages that was required for policy reasons on the basis of wind work. What's wind work? Ah, well, my, my, my lord, perhaps um, issue three is, is the better issue in which for, for me to make, make this point on, um, which um, uh, although it's in the context of the human rights um, uh, damages, you'll see about four lines up from the bottom. Which paragraph are we on now? Paragraph 30, my lord. Paragraph 30. 30. And you'll see that he says, for this reason, I do not think that the damages ought to have been more than nominal, either to reflect the loss of liberty or the loss of the procedural and substantive protections afforded by a lawful um, uh, detention. Both the grounds for both these grounds for substantial award are ruled out, as Baroness Hale acknowledged in paragraph 74 in Kambadzi, by the inappropriateness after Lumba of vindicatory damages in cases of this kind. Are you saying that's what the judge effectively did here, was to award vindicatory damages? I, I'm saying, my lord, that that's effectively what the judge's reasoning in terms of why he says he rejects the approach that the Secretary of State urged upon him. And why he says this in principle, Article 27 should be treated in some way, uh, on my submission, in some way different, and why the court should resist taking that normal approach of asking whether or not somebody could and would lawfully have been detained. That passage I took you through in the judge's judgment is, is, is saturated with a concern that if damages aren't available, that may in some way encourage the Secretary of State to be more casual uh, in their approach to. Um, in their approach to decisions around detention making. Um, and I don't accept the premise of, of that, but in any event, it's wrong in principle. Um, to be taking that approach. Um, there are some illustrations um, in the case law um, uh, if that would assist. Um, that I've referred them to them in my skeleton argument, but in particular the decisions um, in O in the Supreme Court and, and in uh, Abdullahi. Um, the decision in O. Now, were any of these cases about EEA nationals? Uh, my, my Lord, no. These aren't cases that are to do specifically with Article 27, but they are cases in which the public law breach. Uh, involved or encompassed uh, a failure on the part of the Secretary of State um, to make appropriate um, inquiries and consideration. And there are cases in which the court, in its approach to considering whether nominal or substantive damages were appropriate, uh, looked to what the outcome of such inquiry would have been. So that's why they're relevant. So what you're saying, they develop the principle that was set out in this authority? Um, uh, they, they, they develop uh, the, the uh, lumbar um, money, yes. They show the application of uh, lumbar type yeah. cases, to, and they show that the judge is wrong to say that in cases involving public law breaches, you are confined to looking at the material that was before the decision maker when you're asking the question of nominal versus compensatory damages. But that, if, 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 I'm sorry, is that because the counterfactual looked at more generally, because we're here talking about uh, effectively procedural breaches? Um, the counterfactual is um, the, the Secretary of State uh, simply having done what he was required to do in terms of procedure. Yes, in terms of had the inquiry been had, had the inquiry been made, and in doing that, they consider what, as it were, the inquiry would have uh, would have yielded. So, if we look, for example, at um, Abdullahi, which is tab twenty-eight uh, in the second. Um, and this was a case 
in which the breach of public law that was in play uh, was a failure on the part of the Secretary of State to make a referral to the Office of the Children's Champion. Make a referral to whom? The Office of the Children's Champion, my lord, which is a body that um, effectively exists to, uh, as its name suggests, uh, promote the rights of children. And in certain circumstances, a referral has to be made to that um, uh, body where there are, uh, where consideration is being given to the removal. Is this a case of administrative detention at all? My lord, yes, this, this was a case of detention with a view to, this was also a, a deportation um, case. Um, the Secretary of State is obliged to make a referral to the Office of the Children's Champion in cases where the deportation or detention of the national offender will have ramifications in terms of children. And the Secretary of State had failed to make such a referral um, as soon as practicable, as the Secretary of State was required to do. And because of that failure, detention was unlawful. But the claimant was only entitled to nominal damages rather than compensatory damages because had that inquiry been made, it wouldn't have made a difference. It would still have been detained. So, Mr. Abdullahi was a foreign national offender, was he? Yes. Yeah, not an EEA national. Not an EEA national. So he was uh, subject to automatic deportation provisions, is that right? Yes. Yes. And uh, however, however automatic it might be, the Secretary of State had a, a duty to uh, refer, what, his child? Uh, I, I believe that it was his, that, 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 that it was his child, yes. But certainly a, a child who would be affected by the decision. Yes. To the Office of Children's Champion. Yes. Right? Yes. And he didn't do that. Yes. And uh, um, uh, so the detention was unlawful for that reason. Yes. And uh, the court held it wouldn't have made any difference. And so he only gets nominal rather than compensated yeah. damage. The, the, the structural similarity here. So how is it a development, to use my lady's phrase, of lumber? It's just the same as lumber. It's an, it's an illustration. It's an illustration. It's an illustration. Yeah. That, that's right. I, I don't rely upon it as establishing a new point. Well, do we need all. numerous illustrations? I mean, we, the lumber is the, the law of the topic, isn't it? It is, my lord. It was simply to illustrate the fact that you don't stop the inquiry with what did the decision... Because if you stop the inquiry with what did the decision maker actually have, you would need to ask, well, what would have happened if, if, if the referral had, had, had been made? Would that have made a... Would that have made a difference? Well, Lumber looked at Coyle and Wood, and, 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 and Wood s certainly um, suggests that there is a cap counterfactual, um, and, and it's really the identification of what the proper counterfactual is. Yes. The, the, where you say that the judge went wrong. That's, that, that's right, my lord, yes. I see what the judge has to say is, well, okay, if you've said that this is unlawful because you haven't had regard to the particulars or the underlying particulars, or you haven't made a sufficiently um, Buster Times inquiry, you have to ask, well, would that have made a difference? Or is this a case where this is an individual who would have been, uh, could and would have been detained in any event? And so, so you, you, you say, well, once the liability issue has been determined, you as it were forget about that. So the, the, the reason for the unlawfulness, um, we, we don't make any further inquiry about that. We simply go on to the uh, lumber stage, to the quantum stage, and look at Coyle and Wood. Well, we, 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 you, you need to look at the nature of the um, the nature of the breach when you're considering the counterfactual. Yes. But, but, but that, that's to work out the counterfactual. Yes, that's right. Um, 
you, you, you don't, there isn't, as it were, a different category of public law breach where you don't apply the Lumba approach to compensatory versus nominal damages. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my point. So my point is that the judge appears to seek to create or uh, rely upon the existence of such a category in relation to Article 27. Um, the other illustration, and I, I won't take you to it if, if, if you don't think it's consistent, but simply the, the O case. And that was a case where the failure was on the part of the Secretary of State uh, to properly... That was consider. a mentally ill uh, detainee. That's right. And uh, I don't know whether the Supreme Court actually said uh, that he would have been detained anyway. They just said it was arguable that he would have been detained, didn't they? Yes. The, the, the Supreme Court doesn't quite go as far as saying that, 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 that it... Um, it's a relevant question, they said, I think. Is that right? Uh, whether or not he would have been detained elsewhere rather than in immigration detention. Yes, and, and the point that I make again is that in doing that, what they look at is, well, what would have, what would have happened in terms of the inquiries been made? And that includes considering, well, what would the responses to those inquiries have, have been effectively? In particular. Another illustration, if it, if, it, if it assists, would be uh, the, if the Secretary of State has failed to arrange for a medical examination uh, of somebody. Uh, there's first instance authority that failure to arrange a medical examination in accordance with the detention center rules will render a detention unlawful without more. But when it comes to damages, if a medical examination would have said, well, he's fit and healthy, there's nothing wrong with him, a person isn't entitled to compensatory damages just because that medical examination wasn't arranged. Obviously, if it's a case where a medical examination hadn't been arranged and the outcome of the examination would have been this individual isn't fit to be detained, they would then be entitled to compensatory damages. But in both those cases, you're looking beyond what the decision maker actually had in front of them at the time of making the decision. So that's my... I'm sorry, just two very short points on that. What, what, just, just the name will do, or the citation will do, what, what's the authority that you ah, rely on? So my, my Lord, it's a case called ZA. I, I brought copies. Um, in, in fact, if it would assist, I can hand... Um, that up. Rather resistant to having yet more authorities uh, when we've got uh, an absolute plethora of them already. And it's just an illustration of the lumber it's, point. It's, it's just an illustration, yes. So I, 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 if it won't assist, I won't. Uh, but it, but it's Zed, just give us the reference. The reference is 2018 EWHC 183. And the name? Uh, ZAR on the application of ZA. And the Secretary of State for the Home Department. Um, I, I understand that it is under appeal at the moment, but I don't know anything more than the fact that it's under appeal. Well, she is only first instance anyway. That's why I say, my lord, it's only an illustration. It's not a. Um, a principle. It, it, hmm? yes. it doesn't develop the principle, it's just an No, it's just an illustration. Right. Just, just one, one last point on that. When I said it, you, 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 once you get onto quantum, you ignore the, 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 the liability question. In, in this example, the medical examiner. In terms of um, the assessment of quantum, it wouldn't matter, would it, uh, why there was a failure to arrange a medical examination. So there might be a policy that they don't examine, or it, there might be uh, a failure of the implementation of a policy to examine. All of that, none of that matters, no. uh, because you've got the breach once you've found the, the, the liability, and then you simply move on to the the, the longer quantum question in the way that you're seeing. That, 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 that. That's my um, positive case of appeal. I perhaps just very briefly address um, the matters that have the respondents notice because it suggested that the um, that there's a logical fallacy in suggesting that in a failure to make inquiries type case um, there hasn't been any real loss because it said the period of detention will necessarily be longer than it would otherwise have been uh, in a failure to make inquiries type Yes, you had better address that, because uh, uh, the point is, as I understand it, that uh, uh, if, as the judge said, and for this purpose we're having to agree with him, uh, uh, that uh, you ought to have got, the secretary ought to have got the information within 24 hours, uh, then the whole procedure would have been... Uh, uh, collapsed, or uh, 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 would have, or, or uh, he would have been let out earlier uh, by so many days. And, and the, the 
point I mean there are that would be a fact sensitive question. It's certainly not a logical question because the overall period of detention that somebody would have been subject to may depend upon a number of different processes that are running in parallel and strands of gathering information that are running in parallel. Um, so, which is why I took you earlier to the fact of the um, uh, deportation questionnaire uh, and the claimant's request for additional time to complete the deportation questionnaire. The event that the power to detain, as it were, existed for was the decision on whether or not the claimant could be removed. A failure to have gathered the much more limited information that may be necessary in order to satisfy the Article 27.2 individualized proportionality assessment doesn't demonstrate that the overall period of detention would have been any shorter. Because there is the need for the further information in relation to the Article 28 compliant decision. To give another illustration, let us suppose that you're dealing with an individual who can't be removed for a period of time because inquiries are undergoing <coughs> as to which state they're from and the state of refusal to issue an emergency travel document. If those inquiries are ongoing, if those inquiries are being pursued in due expedition, if those inquiries uh, would mean that a person would be uh, in detention for, let us say, three months, the fact that there has been a failure to make an inquiry, let us say, into one aspect of the um, applicant's uh, personal uh, life, which would have taken, let us say, for the hypothetically two weeks, well, that doesn't have then a bearing on the overall period for which they would have been detained. It, it's whether the, step, the Secretary of State failed to take it on a critical time. It may, it may not be. That's your position. Yes, and, and, and as uh, Lotus's boss observed, the, the, the precise route won't necessarily, uh, in terms of considering counterfactual, won't necessarily matter. But on the facts here, just turning from as worthy the legal analysis to the, the, the facts in this case, and why I say the court can be confident, because I accept the burdens of the Secretary of State to establish that he could and would lawfully have been detained. When the judge comes to look at the uh, Secretary of State's analysis of the material in February, um, which um, didn't include the um, pre-sentence report, but included the judge's sentencing remarks, so that's the only sort of further information that is available. Um, and in a sense, it, I appreciate it cuts against me in liability in, in relation to the question of the, the practicality of obtaining the sentencing remarks at an earlier juncture. But it cuts in my favor, I'd say, when you're considering uh, whether the Secretary could and would lawfully have detained. Um, uh, the judge accepts the Secretary of State's considerations in relation to risks of absconding and uh, reoffending, um, And there's no challenge um, before this court uh, to the judge's conclusions in relation to that. And well, I'm not sure I'm understanding your argument. The, uh, 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 what Mr. Musica says, as I understand it, is that if the uh, General had been uh, present 
months delay and uh, everything would have happened much more quickly. Uh, and I say, my lord, that the material we're talking about in terms of the breach of Article 27.2 is a very limited part of the material that had to be gathered between the start of detention and the February detention review. So it's not said that you needed all the material, for example, that you get from the deportation question. The particulars of the offending, which are necessary for the consideration of the underlying behaviour rather than the um, fact of the offence on the claimant's case, um, uh, is, is, is only a small part of that, um, of that picture. And the defendant would have had, in any event, would have needed to provide the claimant the opportunity to make um, representations in response to the, um, the deportation question. I mean, you, you, you say that all, 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 if the Secretary of State had acted as he ought to have acted, um, all that would have done is brought forward uh, a lawful decision to detain him. Yes. It wouldn't have brought forward the decision to remove. So he would have been in detention. Or, or, or the decision to release him. Yes, well, exactly. Um, that, that's precisely it. And that's why, in my, in my submission, he wouldn't have been entitled. Um, compensatory damages. Um, and just so that you've got it, the reference in terms of the um, judge's acceptance of the Secretary of State's analysis of the Mr. Scotty offending is at paragraph um, 66. Uh, and then at paragraph 67, there's the point that um, the Secretary of State had also been given conscientious consideration to the question whether or not uh, release or detention was necessary. So I accept that it will be fact sensitive to what extent the fact that there is a subsequent lawful period of detention enables a court to conclude that somebody could and would have been detained during a previous unlawful period of detention. I'm not asserting that in all cases that's a legitimate inference to draw, but in this case, um, it is in my submission a legitimate inference to draw on the basis of. My lord, uh, my lady, uh, uh, unless there are any particular matters, I think those are my positions. I'll quickly turn them back. Thank you, Mr. Rabbit. Thank you, Mr. Uh, yes, Mr. Dubinsky, uh, reply first on uh, stages one and four. On period one, my lord and my lady, I have six points. I'm going to start with. Uh, the point on which we opened today, which was the appearance of the PNC that we have not, indeed have not seen before today. Um, can I point out the watermark, the 10th of February 2015, to just a simple point, which is this doesn't appear to be a PNC that the decision maker would have had on the 27th of January. So, and it makes sense, of course, that the PNC... Now, what watermark are you referring to? Oh, sorry. On, so if you look at every page, there's a diagonal watermark, 10th of February, 1 p.m. Yes. So I'm just starting by saying that on the face of the document, this is actually not a document that was created on the 27th of January. And the other place we can see the date is that at the top left of each page, it's harder to see, but you can again see 10th of February, 1.05 p.m. So, and... I so suppose the formal position is that uh, the Secretary of State is asking for permission uh, to adduce further evidence in the form of this uh, 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 PNC, which wasn't before the judge, and we've got to make a decision as to whether we allow that uh, evidence in uh, first. Uh, but if we do, you say, or indeed maybe one reason for not allowing it, uh, that it's not a contemporaneous document. Well, my, my lord, actually, I was, you're, uh, we're sort of coming on exactly the point I was about to make, which is that this is one reason not to allow it, that in the Court of Appeal, where we're not engaged, or, or, or should not be, we respectfully submit, 
uh, in an elaborate factual analysis to try and admit sort of on the hoof, as it were, new documents, and especially in the lacuna that we've repeated, repeatedly remarked on of any witness evidence to explain what it is we're seeing, there is a problem, because on the face of this document, this isn't what Mr. Anderson says it is, because he said earlier this is the document that would have been on, available on the 27th of January. No, it's not. Um, and, well, and, and that's no criticism saying, of Mr. Anderson, but it's, it's just saying that this is opaque. Yes, um, it's opaque as to the date, but it is a pro forma document. Quite so, my lady. My, my point is simply that what it, the, the logical inference we would say, if it were admitted, which we urge the court not to do, uh, would be actually that the PNC gets amended at some point after sentencing. Because, of course, if you look at um, the penultimate page, which is the page that we were looking at, with, at this morning, where it says with intent, you can also see that the sentence was recorded on there. So it would be remarkable speed and efficiency if this had been amended to reflect the sentence on the same day that the sentence was imposed. So the point we're making is that there are questions that arise on the face of this document about what's the date of this document, and on its face, not the 27th of January, it's the 10th of February. Um, you don't have to look at what you call the watermark. In fact, do we? Because the whole document is dated the 10th of February. Yes, yes. It, it's, it's actually possibly for the short-sighted like me, but the watermark is nice and large, but at the top, top uh, left, yes. it's a bit smaller, yes. Um, so, um, so it, it, and, 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 and we do say, of course, that um, this is a respondent's notice point. So if... So you invite us not to admit this document? Quite so. Right. Um, should I make submissions in the alternative of what to make of it if you do admit it? My first point is Yes, uh, you better, uh, yes, yes, shortly. Um, if the court were minded to admit it, we say firstly the question of intent, if indeed that were known to the Secretary of State, and it seems here it was only, it only this document only comes into being on the 10th of um, the question of intent is not probative of propensity to reoffend. It is probative of the gravity of the offence. Uh, and as we submitted yesterday, those are uh, distinct questions. Um, but and, and we, we, we also point out, if, if the court were minded to admit this, that none of the detention documents in this case, in periods one and two, so none of the detention reviews, the minute of decision to detain 28. They don't refer to an offence of possession with intent. They simply refer to possession. So for the Secretary of State to now come and say, um, I think possibly the, the, the instance of the urging of the court of love discretion of, 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 uh, of intent, for the Secretary of State to now come and say, ah, oh, but we, we actually did have a document that says intent. It's an after afterthought, as it were. Yes, it's a further respondent's notice. Yes, yes, but it also can't possibly go to the question of, so Secretary of State didn't say it at the time, didn't say it when arguing this case, and the fact that it materialises now, as it were, the rabbit out of the hat at the last possible moment, is an indication it can't possibly have formed the basis on which the Secretary of State was detaining the claimant. Quite apart from the fact that the, the document seems to yeah, post the judge the didn't event. rely on it because she was not aware of it, yes. Mm. Um, so, so those are our points on the uh, on the PNC. Um, our second point is now a point of principle. So Mr. Anderson submits that member states have a wide margin of appreciation as to the implementation of the Citizens Directive. And he says that the Supreme Court's judgment uh, in Nuasli uh, is authority for that proposition. And I, I don't intend to... to take you back to Nwazni unless it can assist. The, the passage on which um, Mr. Anderson was relying in particular was paragraph 80 of Lord Clark's judgment. Um, in fact, um, what was being said in Nwazni, where there is reference to a margin of appreciation, is that member states have a discretion to derogate from the fundamental freedom of movement on grounds of public policy or public security and that discretion encompasses or, or permits the Secretary of State to 
uh, 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 create a power or, or parliament to, to, to authorise the Secretary of State to detain in circumstances where the decision to deport has yet to be taken. Because that was the key question in the Wesley's. Can you, does EU law, by the time we reached the Supreme Court, the key question was, does EU law permit you to have a power to detain before the decision to deport has been taken and, and which has no time limit? So Nwazli is certainly not authority for the proposition that 27.2 of the Citizens Directive contains any margin of discretion. Nwazli Supreme Court is actually about 27.1, is the concept of public policy is the margin of discretion, or margin of appreciation, terms are used interchangeably, um, sufficiently wide to allow the creation of this power under 27.1, and the Supreme Court's answer is yes. Um, could I take you to this case of Van Duyn, which is in volume one of the authorities? Have we seen this authority before? You, you haven't, my lord. It's in my... I don't think we're going to have new authorities in reply. Uh, my, my lord, can I say, it's, it's, it's cited in our, in our speaking note, it's cited in our submissions, it's always been in here, but, but yesterday I was actually... No, it becomes endless if we have new authorities in reply. Can I, perhaps, perhaps what I will do then, rather than taking you to it, is actually say the, articulate the proposition and, and give you the passages in Van Duyn that are that we say are particularly important. Um, so it's paragraph 13 of Van Duyn, and it's a seminal case that establishes that the predecessor provision to 27.2, which was Article 3.1 of Directive 64.221, is directly affected. And what Article 3.1 of Directive 64.221 says is... What proposition in uh, Mr. Anderson's argument are you uh, replying to? Mr. Anderson says there is a margin of appreciation as to Article 27 Citizen Directive, and we're saying not as to 27.2. So Van Duyn shows that the reason why the Court of Justice in that seminal case says this is a directly affected provision, and it's talking about the predecessor to Article 27.2, says the reason why is this is a limitation of a discretionary power which national laws confer on authorities uh, 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 for the entry and expulsion of foreign nationals. And it also specifically explains that it, is, uh, that it does not have uh, exceptions or conditions. So that was the point I was going to take you to in Van Duyn. So there's a, the, re, the basis on which it said that this predecessor provision to 27.2 is directly affected is that it is not subject to exceptions or conditions and it limits the discretion of member states. Right, next point. Yes, and, and uh, uh, turning on to... Our third point is that Mr. Anderson said yesterday, uh, in response to a question from my Lord Lord Justice Hickenbottom, um, and he was asked, well, were, were there any justifications other than the title of the offence and the length of sentence? He said, well, the absence of information. And we say that's an extreme and back-to-front approach, because what the Secretary of State is essentially saying is that less information he has, the more justification he has. Our fourth point is that Mr. Anderson yesterday said that the cases of Alchodor and Kay could not assist us because he says, well, those detention, those cases were not about public policy or public security. They're about asylum seekers who haven't committed any criminal offences. And we say, well, that's illogical because what is said in K, in particular, when, when <coughs> articulating the principle that Article 6 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, imposes a strict necessity test, that's referring to the general protection afforded by Article 6 of the Charter to deprivations of liberty. But in any event, the simple answer to Mr. Anderson's submission is that in K, in precisely the passage that we've both cited, you, cited to you, the Court of Justice 
bases its analysis on a case of J.N. Now, we have copies, but mind, mindful of what my Lord Lord Justice Mark Longwell says, I, I don't propose to hand it up unless I'm asked to, but the simple point about JN is JN is about a different provision which is about public policy and public security. So the first case of the Court of Justice that says you have a strict necessity test under Article 6 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, it's a grand chamber judgment, JN, it's cited in K, so the first judgment is about public policy and public security. It is about a, a criminal offender and the circumstances in which he can be detained. So uh, the distinction that Mr. Anderson seems to make simply uh, does not work. Um, our fourth point, uh, uh, sorry, our fifth point, I think I'm already at, uh, at fifth, uh, was that it was suggested yesterday uh, my, my Lord Lord Justice Longmore to Mr. Anderson, that there was a factual conclusion by the deputy judge of no automaticity below. And Mr. Anderson agreed and said, that's right. But we say, in fact, there is no such conclusion. Might I ask you please just to turn up the judgment at paragraph 59? So this is page uh, 194 of the core bundle. And if you could look... Uh, It's about 10 lines up from the bottom, and it's number five. So there's a series of numbered explanations about which of the parties' contentions are accepted or rejected. And it's number five. We have, I agree with Mr. Anson, stage one and two detention decision were focusing on what was known about the claimant's individual case and circumstances, and that detention was not treated as automatically following from the fact of his being a uh, convicted uh, criminal. But the test is not whether detention automatically followed from the mere fact of being convicted criminal. Um, and we, we entirely accept it's not just the fact of conviction, but the title of the offence and the length of sentence. And, as Mr. Anderson would put it, the lack of information, which underpin the decision to detain. But we say those are impermissible bases on which to detain, as Orphanopoulos makes clear. And we also point out that what the deputy judge simply does not address is the question of whether there was an impermissible presumption applied. So he's unimpressed by uh, Mr. Anderson's reliance on the serious offences policy, but makes no finding as to whether what happened here was in effect uh, impermissible automaticity. And still, uh, with the judgment open, if I could ask you. Um, Mr. Anderson said yesterday that the deputy judge found that to collect information earlier, or at least earlier than period one, would have imposed an unreasonable burden. But that's not what the deputy judge found. If you could look at paragraph 61, he says, uh, and we've been to this several times before, it would on the face of it be best if proactive liaison arranged between the Home Office and the Criminal Justice Authorities put an executive decision maker more informed position. Uh, and then he also says, in the immediately following comments, the following, which, which, which indicate that he doesn't think there's an impossible burden or unreasonable burden. In this case, the claimant had pleaded guilty, his case had been adjourned for a pre-sentence report, and the extent and implications of his length, lengthy period on remand were discernible. And then at paragraph 62, although I, I should say, in fairness, he, he's commenting here on period two, but we say that these comments must logically also be true of period one. So he says this at paragraph 62, no reason has been provided as to why the PSR should not have been urgently obtained. It existed. It will have been known to and available to those from whom the notification had uh, originated. And, and of course, he, he also goes on in the same paragraph, saying, importantly, no witness evidence has been filed in this case, explaining that some impediment or undue burden arose. So... The passage that Mr. Anderson is relying on in uh, paragraph 59, uh, 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 that the law should not impose an impossible burden, that's at paragraph 59 under number 6. Uh, I agree with him that the law should not impose an impossible burden or place secretary state in an invidious position where circumstances of urgency necessarily leave only limited information about the individuals available. But that's, a, that's actually an acceptance of a point of principle. There is no finding that that's the case here. 
And on the contrary, the deputy judge's scepticism about what happened points the other way. Um, I on the question of whether it would impose an impossible burden, I took the court yesterday to a case of plagiar, and, and my Lord Lord Justice Longwell was, I think, quite unimpressed that it wasn't a detention case. He said, "Is that the best you've got?" and I would emphasize that the Strasbourg Court, and this is not in the context of a test of strict necessity, you must always remember that the test there, the, 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 the threshold there for lawful detention is lower than it is in EU law, but the Strasbourg Court has held that a, a, a national systems must be organized in such a way as to minimize unjustified detention. And they have specifically said in terms of making arrangements for release, sorting out release, it should take a matter of hours. And um, unless the court wants me to, I'm just going to give you the references about where this is said. But we, of course, everything we say about our 51F, we say we are a for sure right because we have a strict necessity test and there is a, 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 an attenuated necessity test at best under our 51F. And the citations are a case called M. In Bailey, volume one of the authorities, tab 20, paragraph 49, and that is then picked up in a case called VM versus UK, tab 21, and the crucial question there is paragraph uh, 38. Those are our points on period one. I turn now to period four, and here we have three points in the file. Um, the first is another uh, 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 note that, again, there's not been a respondent's notice from the Secretary of State. Because the Secretary of State yesterday suggested, rather tentatively, that the Secretary of State was entitled to time after the 31st of March 2015 to, continue to consider the second OASIS report. So we re remembered that we received two OASIS reports on the same day, actually, with, although the first had actually been created on the 31st of December 2014. Uh, and we promptly passed those to the Secretary of State and, and, and Mr. Anderson's submission as well. The Secretary of State needed time to consider it. Um, and it would recall that the risk of reoffending in both was low, but the second report upgraded, as it were, the risk, of, uh, 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 the risk to a known adult uh, to high. And... Um, the deputy judge at paragraph 80 of his judgment reached the conclusion that detention remained lawful between, well, i put it this way. It, he reached the conclusion that detention was lawful until the 9th of April 2015, exclusively because he considered that expedition was a real prospect and 9th of April 2015 was the next review date after the circumstances arose, which made apparent or ought to have made apparent that in fact expedition wasn't going to be pursued and therefore there was no realistic prospect of removal within a reasonable period. So if the Secretary of State can make this point at all, about, well, we wanted time for an OASIS report, it belonged in a respondent's notice. And of course, the further point for the Secretary of State, as ever in this case, is that there's no evidence at all that this is what happened. Nowhere is there a note or record that says, we need time, we are considering the second OASIS time a report, we're making inquiries. There's simply nothing to that effect. There's no evidence that the Secretary of State ever called norms or anything to that effect, and of course, no witness evidence. Our second submission on period four is that Mr. Anderson mischaracterizes our submission about period four. Our submission on period four is not and has never been that period four was unlawful because of a failure to proceed with a reasonable diligence, hard your sync principle four. 
we don't say the Secretary of State should have expedited and should have got on with it. Our submission has always been, once the claimant had issued his claim for judicial review on the 11th of March and removal directions had been cancelled on the 12th of March, it was or ought to have been apparent there was no realistic prospect of removal within a reasonable period. There wasn't, in fact, any consideration or any progress towards expedition. And if we're wrong about that, at the very latest, by the 31st of March, those circumstances were in place that made it apparent or should have made it apparent. Um, so so to, ca to characterize in terms of the hard sing principles, we are in hard sing principle three, firmly. Hard sing principle three is, of course, is there a realistic prospect of removal within a reasonable period. It's not the due, del due diligence and expedition point, which is principle four. We have never put the case on that basis. Uh, the next point is the case of Mukhtar, which you were shown by the Secretary of State, and I do ask you please to turn up. And um, this is at um, volume two, tab 27. Please to paragraph 36. So this is page 661 of the report. So here, Lord Justice Richards emphasizes the word apparent. And, uh, uh, and, and, and Mr. Anderson plays great weight on that. But, but Lord Justice Richards isn't saying here that the Secretary of State has to have turned his mind to the question of duration of detention before Hardyal Singh Principle 3 is breached. Because otherwise, that would have this, the result that if a detainer, for example, skipped multiple detention reviews, or was particularly obtuse, simply failed to get the message from the papers in front of him, then a breach of hard your sing principle three would not be apparent. But that's, of course, not what Lord Justice uh, Richards is saying. Um, it would be contrary to basic principle that the hard your sing principle is concerned with the limits of the reasonable exercise of the power to detain. They don't depend on the mindset or the intelligence of the detaining officials or, or whether the detain, detaining officials have actually had a, a think about it. Um, and it's the wrong, what Mr. Anderson seems to be trying to make of this is the wrong way round. Because in the case of Kambadzi, which Mr. Anderson has in fact brought along, um, and I, so we have copies uh, very helpfully for Mr. Anderson if, if, if the court would be assisted. Kambadzi was a seminal judgment in the Supreme Court concerning a situation where somebody had been detained and multiple detention reviews had been missed. And the point that is made in the Supreme Court, in particular by, in Lord Kerr's judgment, is that the purpose of the detention review is to check that the hard your sing principles are being complied with. It's not that the detention review makes the hard your sing principle uh, be fulfilled, as it were. It's that there is an underlying question about whether the Secretary of State is acting within the limit of his powers. And the purpose of the detention review, it's an important procedural safeguard, is to check whether the underlying justification is really there. And, and of course, and Mr. Anderson's submission is all the more confused because he does, of course, rightly accept, uh, and, and this is in his response skeleton at paragraph 65, core bundle 56, he, of course, accepts that the question of whether the hard your sing principles are breached is an objective one and doesn't depend on the state of mind of a decision maker. He's quite right. So what Lord Justice Richards is in fact saying here is that the Hardyal Singh Principle 3 is not breached simply because the prospects of removal are uncertain. It has to be apparent, i.e. more than uncertain, that removal will not take place within a reasonable period. And, and uh, that's actually clear from the submission that's uh, described in the following paragraph, paragraph 37. And if you turn on in this judgment, please, to um, paragraphs 40, 44 to 48. If one can just remember, Mr. Anderson already mentioned the factual context in Mukhtar yesterday. So mix, in, in Mukhtar, an external body, the European Court of Human Rights, had given a seminal and very lengthy, complex judgment 
in a case called Sufi and Albert, uh, Almi, was important as a departure in the law, and it also confirmed in particular, importantly for this uh, uh, claimant, that there were no safe removals to parts of Somalia. Um, and so Lord Justice Richard says in paragraph 45 at D, in the present case, it must be borne in mind that the Secretary of State will have had numerous cases to reassess in the light of a judgment in the Sufi and Elmi case. And therefore, if we look at the first sentence of paragraph 45, albeit with some hesitation, the Court of Appeal upheld the decision of the first instance judge to the effect that the claimant's detention for two weeks after the Sufi and Elmi, Elmi judgment had remained lawful. And the reason for that, and this was um, a self-denying ordinance for, for the appeal court, so this reason for that one looks at paragraphs uh, uh, 46 to 48, is that there was an inter insufficient basis for the court to interfere with the evaluative exercise carried out by the first instance judge on greater material. But that's, it's certainly not authority for a proposition that one can generally take two weeks Still less is it a proposition that in this case, the Secretary of State was allowed to take just under a month from the judicial review claim being issued on the 11th of March, which imposed a, a, a barrier to removal, to work out that the Secretary of State himself, not an external body, the Secretary of State himself is not going to expedite. And it's not about a general proposition, as it were, the Sufi and Almi, where many cases were going to be, have to be reviewed. This is about one removal of one man. Um, could I also highlight um, at the end of paragraph 46, so this is actually the end of um, page 664, there's a quotation from a case called Abdi. This was the second Abdi case. Lord Justice Sedley talks about the difficult evaluative exercise uh, facing first instance judges. And then in the last sentence on this page, so this court will not interfere with the judge's decision unless it can be shown that what is a difficult exercise of judgment is inconsistent with his findings of primary fact, or was based on an incorrect understanding of the law, or was one that was not sensibly open to him on the basis of those facts. Well, Justice Sedley is obviously not saying one never interfere, interferes. In fact, parenthetically, well, we are that, familiar with these principles. Yes, yes. But, but my, my point, of course, is we fall in that category. We squarely fall in that category in terms of what we say about period four. Um, may I also, before leaving this case, draw the court's attention to paragraph eighty-five? So Lord Justice Elias was in the minority on the specific question about whether it was proper to interfere with the evaluative exercise of the judge below. But there can surely be no controversy about the principle that he articulates, namely the need for urgency where personal liberty is at stake, or that it's anathema for normal administrative procedures to dictate the boundaries of lawful exercise to the team. And we say that must apply a for sure I hear, because we have a strict necessity test. Unless I can assist further, that's my reply. Um, turning now to what we say about period two and liability. Uh, 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 retire for a short while now and see what questions we want to ask you. What right?